Greetings from the town that wouldn't die. That's right. Greetings from Tombstone, Arizona. And welcome to the new adventure of Tales of Old Tombstone, brought to you by the Tombstone Monument Ranch and the True Ranch Connection. And the program begins just for you right now. Welcome to Tales of Old Tombstone. We are broadcasting today from the White Stallion Ranch in Tucson, Arizona. We have a beautiful sunny morning down here in the Sonoran Desert. There's a lot of cowgirls and cowboys getting ready to ride out there into the Sonoran Desert and out into the Saguaro National Park. One of the most unique experiences a guest can have down here at the White Stallion. It's also my fortune this morning to be have my guest is Bob Bose Bell. Now, if you know anything about the West the last 45 years, Bob Bozbell has been making his mark on the history and the artwork and the legend of our great Western heroes, heroines, and wild women of the West. Um, I have to say that the first time I became aware of Bob was through two mediums that are still my favorites, a newspaper called The New Times and the radio. Any of us who grew up in the 60s and 70s grew up listening to the uh, radio every single day, maybe three or four different of our favorite stations. And uh, whenever we moved to a new town, we found those stations, locked them in on our radio. We could push the button and make sure that whenever we were driving to work, we could hear our favorite DJs. And we also found our favorite newspapers to find out where we were going, what we were going to do, where the great music was, and uh, and have a good laugh. <clears throat> and Bob Bose Bell played a great role in my young life when I moved to Phoenix, Arizona in 1986 because I discovered the New Times magazine and his great cartoons of Honky Tonk Sue and, of course, 100.7 KSLX, classic rock and roll, got me to work every single morning, Bose and the Jones and Bose Show. Uh, with Gina Sedella, and we, uh, if it wasn't for Bob, I don't know if I would have gotten to work on time and uh, the smile on my face because I worked at Channel 3, and the first thing I had to do was call all the police and fire stations and find out who died <clears throat> the day before. And so <clears throat> I had a, I got to laugh my way into work listening to Bob Bo's Bell on the radio. So, Bob, welcome this morning. We're going to talk about Wide Earp Radio, Honky Tonk Sue, and... Um, all the fun you've had since the 1980s with these great Western heroes. Well, that was a great introduction, young man. I can't believe you knew all that. It is Jeannie Sedello. Thank you. Uh, but other than that, you nailed it, sir. And, uh, yeah, this was a wild time in, uh, in Phoenix. Um, I was on, uh, I was in the New Times doing cartoons, as you said, Honky Tonk Sue, and I had two outrageous things happen. One is Columbia Pictures bought Honky Tonk Sue to play be played by Goldie Hawn and they, uh, Larry McMurtry wrote three scripts. I couldn't believe I, I had to pinch myself this cartoon that I was making $25 a week doing. <laughs> and I ended up in Hollywood for that. And then the second thing is I came on the, uh, uh, David K. Jones radio show at KSLX at the Safari Resort in Scottsdale, Arizona in 1986. As a guest, and I'd been doing this because I had a book out called Low Blows, of my other cartoons I did for New Times. And uh, I was just a guest, and they called me before I came in, and they said, uh, would you uh, mind doing the news? I said, why? And they said, well, our news person just quit. And I said, thinking on my feet, I said, well, do I have to do it straight? And they said, no, you can do whatever you want. And I said, okay, I'll see you at four in the morning. So it was a morning <laughs> show. You know, so I had to drive uh, out to Scottsdale. And we get on the air, and David K. Jones just lets me go. And so I'm uh, just riffing on the news and just shredding it, okay? And uh, we had a great time. I got to plug my book, and I got off. And now I had to go to my real job, which started at 9 at, at New Times, and the program director, who's smoking in the hall, you know, this one is smoking. <laughs> he smoked in the Bad studio. Bad and cigarettes. Yeah. And he goes, I want to talk to you. And I go, okay. And I had all my stuff. I was ready to go. And so we go down this dark hallway, and we go into this back room full of records, you know, records. Imagine that, records on every wall. He goes behind his desk, and he says, Bob, 
I want to hire you. And I go, for what? And he goes, to be on the air, man. And I said, I was just totally flabbergasted. I said, well, I don't have a radio voice. I don't, what do radio people make? And he goes, what do you want, kid? And so I, I go out to my car. I drive back to uh, work. I call my wife. And I say, hey, I just got a job at uh, offer at KSLX, and I don't even. They, they wanted me. To know, they wanted to know how much I wanted to make. She said, "Call Tommy Vasquez. It was a friend of hers. Uh, he's the general manager at KDKB, the rival to KSLX, and ask him." So I call KDKB and I go, "Hey, Tommy, uh, I just got a job offer at KSLX, and I want to know how much I I, I want to make." And he goes, Bob, 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 do not take that job. He said, you know, you and I are friends. I've told you for a long time that you that you should be on radio. And I said, yeah, Tommy, but you never offered me a job. <laughs> so he goes, okay, here's the deal. If they offer you fifteen thousand a year, it's it's a joke. It's a it's a practical. It's a PR stunt. If they offer you thirty grand, it's real. So I call back the uh, program director, and he says, hey, meet Carl Hamilton at 5 o'clock when we get off at the Safari Resort in the bar, and he wants to hire you. And I said, okay. And so I met there, and we met at a two-top, and we're sitting there, and he uh, we get beers and everything, and he starts laying it on. Bob, but you just have the ability to just connect with people. We just think you have a future in radio. And I said, yeah, what are you offering me? And he goes, we're going to pay you. 15,000 a year. I said, and I said for the first time in my life, no thanks. And he, he was, he was kind of stunned. And I just thought, you know, I don't need this job. You know what I mean? It's three hours of the day that I'm not using, four to nine, but I, you know, no, I don't want to do it for that. So I thought, well, I've got in my car. I drove back to work and I thought, okay, that's over. I, you know, I was kind of stressed about it and everything. I get to work and there's a, hey, we just got a phone call. And so I call him back and he goes, all right, we'll pay you 30 grand. <laughs> 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 so then I thought, well, I guess I better just try it. Uh, 10 years later, I was making $112,000 a year doing, you know, just doing what we're doing right now, just riffing. And that was my career on radio. Well, I'll tell you, you made a lot of people happy on the radio, Bob. And, uh, um, as someone who would uh, get up in the morning early to the assignment desk at Channel 3, uh, listening to you and listening to the news, it, uh, it it brought some cheer to the day. And I think that that's one of the things you and I have talked about for years as I've worked with you at True West Magazine for the last 10 years is that humor is in so important to everything we do. And whether it's <clears throat> television news or the New Times or you know working in some form of journalism, um, I later on, um, when I first got to meet you <clears throat> outside of going to your concerts around Phoenix, maybe playing uh, on a double bill with Hans Olsen at the Sun Club was. Yeah, con <laughs> concerts is a little strong, young man. <laughs> you know, when there's, when there's beer and wine on the floor, three inches thick and people are rolling in it, <clears throat> that's not a concert. You know? <laughs> that's a show. That's that, theater. Yeah, that's a bar. Son. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, G-L-O-R-I-A. Correctamente. At the, at the, at the Sun Club with Bob Bo's Bell's band. Um, and, uh, that's probably where I met you for the first time. But uh, a few years after uh, uh, Channel 3 and you were at KSLX, I came back to Phoenix after a stint in Los Angeles and was working at Arizona Highways Magazine with a great editor, Bob Early. You Harrelson was the publisher. And the magazine was at the height of its power as a publication. And you came in with um, uh, a stack of some of the most unique and original illustrations and artwork of gunfighters and Billy the Kid and Wyatt Earp. And uh, it was a huge hit. It was a big seller for uh, for Arizona Highways magazine. And Bob Early, um, who I think we should talk about just a little bit, is that he um, dedicated himself to um, surprising his readers and most people who got Arizona Highways magazine in the 1990s still expected a beautiful photograph on every cover of Arizona Highways. And every month when I was there, there was a huge fight between the Pete Ensenberger, the photography editor, 
and Bob early because Pete said our readers want a great photo of the Grand Canyon or a saguaro, the beautiful photographs that have defined us since 1925. And Bob early said, no, I don't think so. I think we need to keep them on their toes. We need to surprise them. And I think uh, next month we're going to – I have an artist coming in, a, a historian, a writer about uh, – his name's Bob Bose Bell. And um, which is like everyone's like, Bob Bose Bell? He's a disc jockey. He's a cartoonist. Yeah. What are you talking about? So, Bob, tell us how you got to walking in the front door at Arizona Highways, your story – um, how you got there with this stack of illustrations, long way from Honky Tonk Sioux. Well, this is a great story, uh, and, and it really shows people. I think you got to think on your feet, and you got to ask for the order. And here's the here's what happened. All right, you're absolutely correct. I was uh, perceived in the market as, oh, he's that rock and roll guy that does cartoons, you know. But what they nobody knew was that I loved history. That was, you know, and so I had a chance. In fact, nobody at, at Arizona Highways would talk to, to anyone at New Times because we were seen as hippie, dope-smoking freaks, you know. And uh, so, which was half true in my case. Well, maybe three-quarters true. I, okay, it was all the truth. Okay. But anyway, uh, so uh, Lorna Holmes got a job over there, and she had worked with me at New Times in the graphics department. And she put my name in, okay? And she called me, and she said, you know, there's a new editor, and his name's Bob Burley, and he – would uh he's he's agreed to meet with you be on your best behavior so i uh i'm going to the, the you know the the other side of the tracks here you know and i so i, I wore a tie and everything and i i had this whole presentation on how i should do this article on billy the kid and i brought in all this stuff and everything and i get in there i'm nervous and he's there and there was another woman there, i can't think of her name but anyway I unload this thing and I'm about halfway through and he says, wasn't Billy the Kid in New Mexico? And, and <laughs> that, my whole thing was about the Lincoln County War and how that, and I say, thinking on my feet, yes, Bob, you are correct, but he killed his first man in Arizona and he said, Okay, I'll take that article, six pages. You know, and he gave me the page count. And so I went on and went, whoo, I barely, barely dodged a bullet there. So now I'm going in and, um, the, uh, Gary Bennett is the art director who I later became good friends. Chris are, Mitchell might have been the, uh, uh, assistant art director at that time with Gary. Well, uh, anyway, uh, Gary Bennett was the art director and I hit it off with him because, our, our his grandfather's farm and my grandfather's farm were a quarter mile from each other in Thompson, Iowa. What what are the odds of that? That's just insane. So uh, I'm there, and um, Bob Early comes on the intercom into the room we're in, and Bob Early says, "Hey, what's with that photo? The, the, that that photo doesn't work. That is not a cover. What do you, what are you guys thinking?" He was pretty upset, you know. And so uh, he he hangs up the intercom and he rolls his eyes, you know, and boy, we're back to square one on that. And I said, and I quote. Let me have the cover. And and Gary Bennett says, are you sure? Would you have anything? He said, oh, yeah, I've got a big painting, which I hadn't done yet. <laughs> <laughs> and so he goes, well, I'll mention it to him, but don't expect anything. Long story short, I ended up on the cover of Arizona Highways with a painting, an oil painting of Billy the Kid. It is my most successful painting to this day, and that's how it happened. That's incredible. <clears throat> That's the serendipity of uh, of this business, I believe. Yeah. And um, and here, here's the me- here's the message. Okay. The universe is trying to help you. Okay. Pay attention, because the, the, all those things are there, and you just have to be aware of it. You know, you just have to take advantage of the moment. So after Billy the Kid, um, in the Phoenix Marketplace. How did that change your perspective on what you could do for the future or your goal of writing about some of your other legendary Western heroes like Wyatt Earp? Well, I have to go back to Christmas in 1989, which is just shortly before this incident at Arizona Highways. My mother sent me for Christmas a used book, and I was kind of disappointed in a kind of like, really? It went to Goodwill and sent me a... (laughs) 
Where, you know, there's no mittens in here. There's no skis. You know what? And, and so it was this used book. And it was on, the name of it was The Saga of Billy the Kid by Walter Noble Burns. And, uh, I thought, oh, God, I know the story of Billy the Kid. I, you know what? And so I, my kids were little at the time and they're, it's Christmas morning and they're flipping around and, you know, and tearing up the boxes and stuff and screaming and stop running in the house and all that's going on. And I'm sitting on the couch and I open up the book and the first lines are, John Chisholm knew cows. And Billy the Kid doesn't show up till page 13. And I am engrossed in this book. And my wife says, we're going to bed. And I go, okay. And she kisses me. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, I finished the last page of that book. And I set it on the coffee table, table and said, this is what I was born to do. And that was the moment that, that led to the Arizona Highways. Mm-hmm. And it also led to... Uh, all my books, 15 books so far, on Wide Earp, Doc Holiday, Billy the Kid, you know, Jesse James, uh, uh, Wild Women, and uh, also led me to buying True West. That's incredible. And that may be the greatest gift your mom ever gave you. It's the greatest gift she ever did. I, 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 I called her and I, I, I wept. I was just, I, you know, I thought I knew. And what, it, what happened was I'd forgotten this. I'd gone off in a rock and roll tangent and thought I was going to be the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. You know, I was in that zone, you know, and cars and fast women and the other way around. And uh, I uh, I got lost, but my mom brought me back. So how did you juxtapose in your mind, because we know plenty of writers who are, they're Billy the Kid all the way. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> you really don't find a lot of authors who write equally and I think you're one of the few, equally, about Billy the Kid, New Mexico, the Lincoln County War, which is all its own complexities, and then Wyatt Earp and Cochise County and um, and everything that is complex about his life. And one dies, you know, before he's an adult, and one lives a full life. Yeah. With that, I think we're going to take a short break, Bob. We're going to thank our friends here at White Stallion and come back and hear that story. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you, Bob. And no kidding, that's quite a story about you, Bob, and then, of course, Billy the Kid. And uh, this is just a part of all the good things that can happen to you when you take some time to enjoy Tales of Old Tombstone. And I'm Stan Houston, and I have the privilege and pleasure to uh, help bring this program to you through the Cowboy Spirit USA Radio Network. Hey, Tombstone, have you ever dreamed of going to Tombstone, Arizona? And uh, riding the range and learning to herd and drive cattle on a working ranch? I mean, you uh, want an exceptional, different vacation. Well, then the true ranch cowboys and the cowgirls at Tombstone Monument Guest Ranch, that's part of the true ranch collection, are waiting to welcome you to a premiere Western Dude Ranch experience just outside that town too tough to die. This is an extraordinary adventure for extraordinary people just like you. So why don't you uh, get some more information on that? It's a wonderful place to go, and uh, you will find it wonderful, awesome, truly memorable. Hey, TombstoneMonumentRanch.com. That's TombstoneMonumentRanch.com. Or give them a call at 520-457-7299. Once again, 520-457-7299. We're back with Bob Bowes Bell here on the Tales of Old Tombstone at the White Stallion Ranch, and we're talking about Wyatt Earp versus Billy the Kid. Now, I might have seen that in a Marvel comic about 1973. <laughs> <clears throat> Stan Lee probably did that yeah, one. Yeah, probably if did. not, he, the guys at DC did it. But, um, Bob, I, we were just talking about the fact that you are very unique as a historian and artist <clears throat> in that you walk the walk with both. Billy the Kid and Wyatt Earp. Um, 
How did you get from Billy the Kid to Wyatt Earp? What, how do you, and how do you uh, keep those two framed in your mind? I think it's very interesting to, to be a, a great researcher for both. You know, uh, I have to credit my grandmother. And um, when I was uh, 10 years old, my favorite TV show came on on Thursday nights. And my uh, mom and dad wanted to go out on a date. And they always sent me up to my grandmother's house. And I loved to go to my grandmother's house because she told me how we were related to outlaws. And I just loved it. And she would, <laughs> I'd go up there and she'd tell these stories. And I would go around and I would say, we're related to outlaws. And my mother's like, hey, would you calm down a little bit? You know, they, was, I was thinking of Bigfoot Wallace, John Wesley Harden, Billy the Kid. And she was hearing, you know, uh, uh, the Boston Strangler, you know, <laughs> Charlie Manson. That's what she was hearing. And so I went uh, I went up to my grandmother's house. It was Thursday night. And uh, she was telling me a little bit about the Old West. But I, my favorite show was coming on. And I said, Grandma, can I turn the TV on? And I saw she was a little bit disappointed. But I, I wanted to. I couldn't miss my show. And so I went over and I turned the TV on just in time to hear this theme song. Why it hurt? Why it hurt? Brave, courageous, and bold. Long live his fame and long live his glory and long make his story be told. And I'm just grooving because the, Hugh O'Brien plays Wyatt Earp, and he's a bachelor, and he drank milk, and he cleaned up every cow town in the West, and I did love the guy because he's got a pistol on a barrel it goes all the way in the dirt and you can write his name in the dirt and uh but in the middle of the song i saw my grandmother's hand come from out from her ta- from her chair and she's pointing at the tv and she turns to me and she says Wyatt Earp was the biggest jerk who ever walked the west <laughs> and so i'm looking at the tv right which never lies and i'm looking at my grandmother and i'm going Ooh, oh, somebody's not telling the truth. I was stunned. I was stunned. And so that is how I came to Wyatt Earp. My family did not like him. Now, they were from an old ranching family down at Steens Pass. And that's about 90 miles from Tombstone. And so they were there in 1900. And so they, their version of the OK Corral fight was from the cowboy side. And to them, the Earps were from uh, the north, number one, they were from out of Texas, and and number two, they were Republicans, and number three, they were from Iowa, okay? And so they, they really disliked, they were carpetbaggers. And they're right. Like, so that's how I came to the story. Now, a lot of people think I'm anti-ERP because of that, well, the story I told, and and, uh, and I'm not a big fan, but he's not, he's not the milk drinking <laughs> guy <laughs> for sure. Uh, but that's where I come to it. And I, and I, in spite of all that, I kind of dig the guy, you know, and he's not, he, boy, he was into prostitution, yada, yada, yada. He was, you know, he was, they, they say, you know, there's a fine line between catching an outlaw and becoming one. Right. And whenever we need to, uh, have people go after outlaws we get need to get people who are as bad as they are because i'm not going to go out there and face four guys in the snow with winchesters well, who is well <laughs> this this badass from <laughs> that's over here with with his own gun and he says i'll do that and you know what courage never goes out of style and that's, that's what it is and and you know what's interesting about that is that <clears throat> we were talking before the break about the fact that white or Lived out a full life. Yes. And Billy the Kid died at 21. Well, yes, yeah, yeah. That's the traditional age. He could have been a little older. He told he told a census make a census taker in 1880 who was 24. And right. He's probably <laughs> lying. Right. But Billy the Kid goes out a rock star. Yes, right? he does. Yeah. He's like Jim Morrison. He goes out a rock yeah. star, and yeah. he's got Pat Buddy Holly. Garrett, Buddy yeah. Holly. Yeah. You got James Pat Steve. Garrett over here though, who lives a full life, except when someone decides that. Pat needs to go. Right. But Pat does not, does not, and we've talked a lot about the fact that who becomes a hero and who does not. Yeah. And uh, Pat Garrett is, he's the man who's willing to go out in the snow yep. with a gun exactly. and track down the guys and bring them to jail. Mm-hmm. But we don't remember Pat Garrett as a hero. Mm-hmm. It's Billy the Kid who's the martyr. Mm-hmm. So how does Wyatt Earp transform from a... Um, pimp, mm-hmm. um, a, uh, a gambler, mm-hmm. uh, even a horse thief mm-hmm. 
to arrested for horse thief yeah. to um, a hero mm-hmm. of the West. And that brings us back to a writer. You have to have a writer. Wyatt Earp tried to sell his story. He was in Hollywood. He was in the last outlaw town. You know, he gravitated from uh, Tombstone to, uh, you know, Idaho to he was in Nome, Alaska. And he finally ended up in Hollywood, which was the last outlaw town. And, you know, Bob, I like to say Los Angeles is the West's most Western town. (laughs) And also... um, I love Zane Gray's comment, which he said, I won't say that everybody in, in, in the movie business is a crook, but I will say that everyone in L.A. who's a crook is in the movie business. <laughs> and, and so White Earp fit right in. And so he was friends with Tom Mix. He was friends with William S. Hart. Uh, John Ford claimed that uh, White Earp was on the set, and that's where he got all of his information for his movie, uh, My Darling Clementine. Right. And uh, so Earp knows you know, hey, you've got a story, you might be able to sell it. And so he tries to write a story, and it's, it's just awful. It's, it's it's terrible, and it's his own life story. Now, he had a wife who said, oh, you can't write about, no, 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 don't write about that. You know, write about when, you know, he saved a woman from a fire one time. You know, that, that was where that story went. And it took, ironically, Walter Noble Burns, the same person who wrote the book, The Saga of Billy the Kid, that changed my life. It took him to go and find Wyatt Earp, but Wyatt Earp wouldn't give him the rights to do it, okay? Because he said, I have an allegiance, I have a dedication to John Flood, who I'm already writing with something. And so he, Walter Noble Burns, thinking at in the moment, said, well, weren't you friends with Doc Holliday? And he said, oh, yeah, he's one of my best friends. And he said... I'm, well, I'm going to do a book on him. Will you talk about him? And so he did. And then in 1926, I think it is, uh, Out Comes Tombstone by Walter Noble Burns. And there's a chapter in there called The Lion of Tombstone. And so Earp is not happy. He's really mad because this guy stole. He, he sees it as him stealing his thunder. You know, he now he doesn't have a book. You know what I mean? And so uh, my the, the story goes on, but let me just say this. You need a writer. Any one of us probably has a, a best-selling book in mind, but you've got to have the right writer to tell your story. And that's what Walter Noble Burns and ultimately Stuart Lake had. Thank you, Bob, for uh, being part of t- uh, Old Tales of Tombstone today, Tales of Old Tombstone. And we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about Wyatt Earp. Doc Holliday and the Cowboys. That's right, Stuart. That's exactly what we are going to do, and I can hardly wait. But you know what? We're going to have to wait till next week. That's right. That's the story uh, that is coming next week. So make sure you come back. Uh, obviously, we've heard about the bad man. Uh, next week, we'll hear more about the lawman. So... Please keep in tune and keep in touch to uh, this fine radio program. And we're glad when you recommend us to others. We're grateful for that. We want to spread the word that one of the finest stories of the West, and of course for those of you who love the Western tradition, uh, right here, Tales of Old Tombstone, the uh, Tales of Tulane Roads, the Cowboy Up podcast, all of these are a part of the network that's coming to you to make uh, perhaps Western civilization just a little bit better because uh, it follows some of the Western tradition. So please be with us, and thank you very much for uh, being a part of Tales of Old Tombstone, and thank you to the White Stallion Ranch and the True Ranch Collection featuring Of course, right here in Tombstone, the Tombstone Monument Ranch. Check those wonderful places out, and uh, you make sure that perhaps on your schedule of things to do this coming summer, uh, that uh, it's time. It's time to go to the Southwest, young man, young woman, old man, old guy. Yeah, and enjoy a Western cowboy tradition experience. All the best to you. Till next time, bye for now.